Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Security Angle. I'm your host, Shelley Kramer, Managing Director of Principal Analyst here at the Cube Research. And I'm joined today by Matt Radelak, who's the VP of Incident Response, Cloud Operations, and SEEU at Veronis. And our conversation today is going to center on navigating the security risks posed by Gen AI and thoughts on how organizations can adopt AI, but mitigate risks at the same time. Matt, I'm so glad to see you again. Yeah, it's great. Great to be here. And thanks for uh, thanks for having me on your show. Absolutely. Absolutely. We got to spend some time together at RSA many months ago. And here we are again. So, yeah. you know, it's funny. Uh, we got to actually get to meet each other in person the first time. We did. We did. It's such a it's such a treat in today's day and age where a lot of our interaction is done by way of Zoom and, and WebEx and Teams and all that kind of thing. So it's great to see you. It's great to have you on the show. And one of the things I always do with my guests is I ask for you to share just a little bit of your career backstory. Sure. What have you got in there that's going to surprise me? Well, I'm going to go way back then because you said you were looking for a surprise. So, <laughs> um, I guess I would say I started my career around age eight to 10 delivering the newspaper uh, and did that up until I could become a lifeguard at the local community pool. Uh, lifeguard turned pool manager, worked at the Apple store for a while uh, but as, a, as like a Mac specialist, helping people decide which phones or computers that they wanted. And then I got really fortunate when I went to university, I went to Penn State, I worked on the student IT help desk. And so while I was in school, I learned all the fundamentals of IT, like, you know, how to do networking and how to administer servers and Active Directory uh, while getting a cybersecurity curriculum. Uh, when I graduated from school, I landed at a, a company called SRA International that specialized in bidding on lots of different cybersecurity contracts for the government. And I was on this cool team. They, they refer to themselves like a SWAT team. It was called Cybersecurity Consulting and Training Services. And so I got to go to various different government agencies from the Peace Corps to the EPA, to the State Department, to the Departments of Veterans Affairs, the General Services Administration, uh, Office of Personnel Management. And I got to work on various small projects to enhance those agencies' uh, security missions with my two longest projects being at the VA to help them remediate what were called material weaknesses and at the State Department uh, to work on the defensive operations and security. And so uh, quite an extensive background on the government side. Uh, then I worked in legal for five years. Uh, and a fun fact about me, um, how I got my job at Veronis, I was talking at a conference uh, and Veronis' CEO was in attendance. And afterwards he came up to me and said, you will work at Veronis now. <laughs> um, and here I am, you know, at more than seven years later, uh, doing a, an interview or, or sitting on a podcast with someone like yourself. That's that's hilarious. Well, I will say that I also had a paper route. It's my first job, and I am just a teeny bit older than you are. But fun fact about that is that um, back then, really only boys had paper routes. Wow. And and I lived, in, I grew up in New York and I lived in a, in a neighborhood where all of the homes were attached townhomes. And it was such a sought after paper route because there were no lawns in between homes. The doors were close together, yeah. It was awesome. And, and my neighborhood paper boy, um, his name was Jimmy, and he just kind of, he'd done the route for a long time and he was kind of tired of it. And I'm like, um, hello, give it to me. Yeah, so anyway. Yeah. Can, so, I, can I ask, did, you know, did you make a nickel of paper? Do you remember? It wasn't very much, but it was also, you know, you had to go yeah. door to door. But you you, learned collection. So, you had to do the carrier collect too. You had to do the collection. Yeah. And the thing wow. about that is that it taught you customer service skills and, you know, being able to speak with adults. And, you know, I mean, I was like 10, you know, so yeah. to be able to bring that and learn that, I think that was, um, that was valuable. Played a, played a valuable role in my career foundation. So thanks for indulging me. I do always learn something interesting. So I, I love your story and that's really done some really cool stuff. So I know that you and the team at Veronis hosted one of your data first forum events a couple of weeks ago. And uh, these events feature CISOs sharing lessons and insights on all things Gen AI. And, and one thing that kind of jumped out at me is that, um, 67% of organizations are increasing their investments in Gen AI, but only one fifth of them feel that they're prepared for the risk that comes along with Gen AI. And I guess so we don't really have to worry about having a timely topic for this conversation, do we? That seems pretty timely. Yeah, the market took care of it for us. <laughs> so in that data first forum, 
I think that I saw you had something like over 1,100 registrants um, interested in and are participating in the conversation. You had 630 plus chat submissions and more than 50 unique questions that were asked over the course of the event. So obviously it was a boring, poorly attended event. No, <laughs> um, but I'm so excited to hear some of the insights from that event. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. I want to start with the obvious. I know that CISOs are being cautious about rolling out Gen AI initiatives. What are some of the key risks that they're worried about associated with deploying Gen AI tools that you learned at your Data First Forum? And I, I want to jump and say data breach, but I'm actually going to cover that one second because I think <laughs> there's some fundamental things about AI that, like generative AI, that people need to understand. One of them is that they're often non determinative, which means you, you and I could give copilot the exact same prompt and get a different response right so that that means that like the you kind of can't treat it all as as fact what you get back right it's a work product that you get back made by this this copilot this smart you know uh, uh assistive technology as opposed to a scientist that can follow a, a logic tree and arrive at the same conclusion and and that conclusion be proven multiple times so there's a risk in the output and the quality of the output in gen ai and so CISOs have to weigh that is is pushing for this, is turning this on, is blocking it. it is their business reward per, you know, uh, in line with the business risk along with the technology risk with right. stuff like a data breach? And a lot of CISOs are concerned about having a data breach caused by generative AI because a lot of these co-pilots, whether it's Microsoft's or uh, you know, Salesforce's Einstein, they use a pass-through permissions model, meaning that whatever the user <laughs> has access to, the co-pilots do. But the advantage that the uh, co-pilots don't, you know, uh, have is that they're technical, they're smart, right? Whereas the, the, they, they have the, the ability to know all, where all the data is, whereas a general user, they, they don't know how to act like a pen tester and find data that they have access to, but that they don't access. Most people, you know, browse data by like what's in their home folder on their Mac or when they open up Teams and what's in the SharePoint sites that they see on Teams, not necessarily the ability to like use a command prompt and find out what else do I have access to? Well, Copilot doesn't have to worry about all that. Copilot knows where everything is. It's <laughs> it's like a, an eminent being that can figure out what exactly what data you have access to at any time. Uh, in Microsoft's case, thanks to something called the graph. Yeah. And that is no small thing to be concerned about. You no. Know, and, and if you think about like, you know, the, the, the CISO is also kind of fighting the do I stop the potential productivity gain with the security concern or can I maybe lock my data down really fast or do this in a controlled way? And so I think what a lot of people came to the data first form to figure out is what are other people doing to experiment yeah. and move forward that maybe I could do to stop being a blocker and start to be an enabler? Yeah. Well, and I think really that's why we have events like that, right? And that knowledge sharing is so valuable with the community, other people in these roles. I mean, we're all trying to figure this out, right? Figuring it out together is a much quicker path to <laughs> definitive results than trying to figure no. it out on your own. So, yeah. So what are some of the challenges and concerns, especially from a security standpoint? I mean, you've touched on some of those, but but as it relates to Gen AI specifically, are there, you know, dig in a little for me, if you would. Sure. One, you can't tell what data you've fed. You know, it's very difficult to determine what's been put into the to the models. So what's been in, you know, as I call it, what's been sucked up by the black hole, right? It's really hard to determine what data has made it in. Uh, that's not necessarily a, a, a clear box. Like the providers don't just show you, hey, is this file been ingested by you or not? Um, and in the act of asking the question, you're likely going to get that file ingested anyway. Uh, and so if you combine that with, it, they're also not uh, so sophisticated yet that when you make a request, uh, you're again, like I said before, you get the same result or you even get any result. Uh, two different people based on like proximity, your role, the data you have access to, your peers, mm -hmm. you, you might get access to something that someone else doesn't. And so their results might appear to be more complete. And so CISOs are also faced with, well, if I've got a data breach risk and I've got a productivity risk, you know, is this even really worth it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that I think that it's really safe to say here is that, of course, everyone is looking to try to get value from their Gen AI initiatives and figuring out where Gen AI presents the most opportunities and the most value for an organization is obviously a key area of focus. How are you seeing business leaders get to the use cases that provide that greatest potential for an organization? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So, so first, I think we could break it down by industry. There are industries that, like, even before this current wave of Gen AI, you know, Copilot for GitHub and Copilot for Excel have actually gotten yeah. some mileage. They've been out for a little while. And so coders and people that create and develop software or compile software or are looking for alternatives in the software development lifecycle, there's there's gains to be had. There's productivity to be had there. Uh, yeah. People that are like Excel wizards, I always ask, you know, you probably have an accountant or a uh, maybe a finance person in your life that like knows how to do Excel macros. Well, yeah, because I don't. Yeah, and well, I don't want now to. you do. If you've got a copilot for Excel, you are you are now a wizard. You know, there you, you now have special powers in Excel that you didn't realize that you had before, uh, because the copilots enable you to do that. Uh, and so, you, you, you just to tie that back to the, the business question, though, you, you have to see. You know, people are gaining a competitive advantage. I think of the fintech industry right now. A lot in fintech is to deal with the ability to compute very, very large data sets faster than your competitors do. And then, you know, some element of risk management or even luck to to guess them, predict the market correctly, um, to then make a trade that someone else doesn't make in order to, to be the first to reap the gains of that. And the yeah. fintech industry is absolutely like pumping trade data into large language <laughs> models and using yeah. you know generative AIs like co-pilots in order to mine insights from that. So are people like marketing and advertising firms though, because you know the, sometimes it isn't that the designer can't create something that's better. It's that you're looking for something fast that can be yeah. good enough. And the co-pilots do hit a sweet spot of yeah. creating images that are good enough for a, a presentation for a small audience that you don't necessarily need to contract an outside designer for. Yeah. And so that's how, like, you know, I, I, I tend to think of them as knowledge workers. There, there are gains for knowledge workers, whether it's in research and content creation or even like content review. Um, like just have someone proofread something for you or have the co-pilot make some edit suggestions for you just to get a second perspective other than your own. There's lots to be had for, for knowledge workers there. I'll also, you know, give another example. Right now we're on a podcast and um, I get excited and I'm probably speaking quickly. Um, and that probably happens on Zoom meetings that I'm on sometimes too. Yeah. But those Zoom meetings have an AI that's recording everything I'm saying and transcribing it to text that it'll send out a transcript to everyone that attends the meeting. And yeah. so th that's a cool gain from AI that you can turn on and get the benefits from so that you can be more present in the meeting as yeah. opposed to being feverishly writing notes the whole time. Yeah. You know, you can just kind of star where you are. There's all these little things that make us more productive or make yeah. us more capable, but not necessarily, you know, cure a disease or make billions of dollars. I, I think some people are, are definitely on to, to those types of things and they're using AI in those ways. But a lot of the, the I call them the gains or the benefits right now are in these productivity type use cases around the office suite. Yeah, absolutely. So talking about the office suite, talking about co-pilots, what does a solid game plan look like if you're setting out to deploy and maintain co-pilots safely? Sure. I think number one is like, you got to do an assessment, uh, like an honest assessment. We call it a Veronis of your blast radius, which is pick a random employee, figure out how much data and systems they have access to. If, if the answer to that is like way too much, you, you, you don't want to jump the gun. Because yeah. once you turn it on and it ingests all that data that all those people have access to, you can't undo that. Um, that that's not something that there's even the, the capabilities for that to be undone. Uh, so once the data gets fed into the models, it's again next to impossible without like restarting your co-pilot tenant to, to undo the data that gets ingested. So one, do an assessment, figure out where you are. Two, build a test plan. But I want that test plan to be twofold. Build a test plan for finding the flaws, like searching for passwords or right. financial data, like thinking like a pen tester would, but also build a test plan for finding the good. You know, make sure that you're spending time coaching your employees or someone is on what's called prompt engineering, yeah. which is how to have intelligent conversations with the co-pilot. Make sure you're holding user groups within your own company or even in your, your vertical to determine how other people are using co-pilots. Um, as a lot of innovation comes from two people being faced with the same problem and trying to solve it in a different way and then coming back together and realizing that a little bit of person A and a little bit of person B and maybe a little bit of co-pilot yeah. gets you to the best place. 
Well, and some of it is, you know, that your point about queries and understanding how to create queries is really important. And I, I use Gen AI all the time. And, you know, sometimes I'm in a hurry and I'll, I'll use a query and it's like, mm, yeah, what was I thinking? You know, and you just because the results you get back aren't really at all what you were looking for. And you're like, oh, hey, dummy, you know, and you go back and, you you know, you fine tune that query and, and it's a skill that you learn over time. But that's tremendously important. In, in, in my experience, in getting the right kind of result from Gen AI that you're looking for. Yeah, and, and much like real conversations with people, you should ask follow up questions. That's another tip I give yeah. when you're in the testing phase. I, I always come back to uh, I was working on a, a Lambda function to process some logs, which is a fancy term for a thing in AWS to help me to you know compute some things. And the first result that I got back from the copilot, I asked, "Is there a more efficient way to do this?" and I got back a new set of code. I asked the question again, and I got back another new set of code. I asked the question again, and I got back another new set of code. So the copilot was only iteratively giving me something that was more efficient than the first thing. And then when I finally asked again, I said, is the result from this different than the first one? The answer was yes. So I had gone so far down the rabbit hole that I wasn't gonna produce the output I wanted anymore. And so you can't necessarily rely on the responses as being like accurate and factual. It's right. think of it as something that can help you do things better and faster, but still require the validation of an expert. That makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. Okay, Matt, as we prepare to wrap the show, I'm going to ask one last burning question. What tips and tricks for safely deploying Gen AI um, and adding it to your tech stack can you share with us? Sure. Choose the data that you don't want to go in, right? I, I have a saying, aim small. Find the stuff that you definitely don't want to get fed into the co-pilots yeah. and block it off, section it off somewhere. Yeah. Because that's probably the fastest way for you to then deploy it elsewhere. You could do that from labeling. You could do that from access control. You could do that from like zero trust network or application management. There's a lot of ways that you can create what people would come refer to as an enclave or like a very small protected place that, you know, stuff doesn't flow in and out of. Um, that would be a very practical thing to do. Another one would be, and, and, and I, I know this might sound simple, but do it. Use the co-pilots. Be a part of the process yourself. If you are a listener to this show, use co-pilots and, and lead the way. Lead by example. Show people that there are responsible ways to do it. Three, you have to police the prompts. Just like any other technology that you introduce to your company, if you would let your employees just go wild and you don't monitor what they're doing with it, you're A, not going to know the good things that are happening, but you're also not going to B, know the bad things that are happening. Yeah. And so by monitoring the prompts, you can see, well, hey, this person over here, they're using Copilot a lot. We should go talk to them uh, or send the business or the project manager yeah. in to go talk to them about how it's going for them. But if you weren't monitoring at all, you won't know who's using the Copilot successfully or who's potentially abusing it. And unfortunately, uh, as, as we do a lot of monitoring for our clients, there are people that are already abusing these Copilots. Yeah, they're asking for passwords. They're asking for salary information and bonus information or personally identifiable data on employees or customers. And, and the, these are things that you have to take seriously if you're a steward of that particular type of data. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. You know, and I will also say, I will add to that, you know, some of this is similar to just corporate digital transformation initiatives and you know in which i've been doing for and with clients for the last decade plus and you know part of our strategy with that has always been to find your internal champions your early adopters people who just get this because once you do that and you know you're monitoring which is really important but you know who those people are and you can tap those people and use them to sort of share their knowledge base but also their excitement about this and i think that you know any organization will have a collection of people some are really Really excited and some are ambivalent and some are scared. You know what I'm saying? But when you can really tap those internal ad early adopters and those champions, I think it can go a long way toward spurring adoption throughout the organization as a whole. And that's always been a, a, an important part of my strategy. Absolutely. That's well stated. Yeah. Yeah. Makes perfect sense, right? Matt Radelak, VP of Incident Response, Cloud Operations, and SEEU at Veronis. Thank you so much for joining me today for this episode of The Security Angle. I knew it was going to be a great conversation. You never disappoint, and I appreciate that. And to our viewers and listening audience, I'm your host, Shelly Kramer, Principal Analyst here at the Cube Research. Keep it on the Cube, your source for enterprise and emerging tech news. And with that, we'll see you next time.